Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Aditi Meyer, and I'm going to be your host today. We have quite a global audience from my morning here in LA to the folks in Europe to the folks in India. So I want to welcome you all today. Um, I want to start by introducing State of Fashion. So State of Fashion is an international fashion platform that connects pioneers in the fashion industry from research and business uh, to design and helps connect all of these ideas. They have a biannual uh, where they have discussion programs, labs for design models, research exhibitions and publications. And amid this time of COVID, they have begun a new series called This is an Intervention. And This is an Intervention is a newly launched digital program and it's about bringing together nuanced ideas about the fashion industry. How do we go forward from where we've been? How do we learn from our histories? And how can we reimagine a fashion industry that is regenerative for all? So throughout this discussion, feel free to leave any questions you might have in the chat below. There is, I'm not sure if there's a Q&A feature, so you can go ahead and leave it in the chat. And at the end of the discussion, I will go ahead and call on those questions. If you want to ask your question personally, um, make a note of that, and I will note that as well. So today's conversation is going to be exploring the idea of decolonial approaches to land, labor, and the fashion industry, specifically situated in the context of India. Um, as someone who has been in the sustainable fashion space for quite some time now and is of South Asian descent, I often think about the ways that, you know, the impacts of colonialism on India's industry still continue today. And so we often see colonialism as this distant abstraction of the past. But when I speak of colonial mentalities or con colonial practice in the fashion industry, it's about a system that is rooted in the extraction and exploitation of resources, whether that's natural resources or labor as the means for infinite success and infinite financial gain. So, when we have this basis that we frame our business model on, uh, we need to really reorient that and decolonize that understanding. And so to start, I would love to have each of my panelists introduce themselves. First, we have Nishant Chopra of Oshadi Collective. We have Rupsi Garg of Keti Virasat Mission. And lastly, we have Dr. Vandana Shiva. So I am gonna ask my lovely panelists to go ahead and start their videos. Um, and Nishant, if you wanna start by introducing yourself, that would be great. Uh, hi, Aditi. My name is Nishant Chopra and I'm founder of Oshadi. Uh, I started Oshadi about four or five years ago uh, when I got back from finishing my graduation. I joined my family run textile business and I just realized uh, that mechanized way of doing things uh, was not enticing for me. And I used to travel to a lot of villages while growing Oh, it looks like Nishant has frozen. A, a piece oh. working with the... Can you hear me good? Is it okay now? All right. Uh, so about uh, when I when I worked for my dad's factory, my family ran factory, I just realized things were not okay. Uh, the way the system was, I learned from a lot of other textile factories around. Uh, I come from a textile hub. So I just wanted to see if there's a way to do things differently. I always complain about things not being right. And I'm really young. I was really young back, like you know, I was 22, and I, was, I, I realized I had a lot of time to make a small impact uh, just the way I can. So we started a women's wear brand uh, just to see, you know, just to connect uh, the artisan community uh, locally with a um, more international market. And as that happened, I got really intrigued by the supply chain. Uh, how things were not right on every level, like the materials, the composition, the pay structure, the payroll. Uh, the environment, the dyes, everything. So we started one step at a time. We started working with the natural dyeing techniques. Uh, we started working with the materials. We started real working with the artisans directly, not just sourcing from them, but just working with them to find better solutions, more environment friendly solutions. A lot of people, what they do is they work with like a dyeing factory or like a small artisan community and they just impose things. Uh, a lot of the brands are like, hey, do you have like a God certificate? Or like, hey, we only work with you if you have a God certificate. We didn't take that approach. 
uh, we started working with artisans directly and we told them, hey, this is a solution and we are going to bring in dyes and you can adopt these dyes even if you don't want it to adopt like for everything you do, but let's start somewhere just with our work. And then, you know, if you keep, uh, if you like working that way and then, you know, you can expand it to your other clientele. And we went all the way back to the, the weaving and uh, and we just re we realized like, you know, just being around the villages, I, I watched a movie called Merku Thoda Chimalai and it's a Tamil movie. It's about uh, this vicious circle of poverty, which the farmers are caught up in by these uh, chemical companies, pesticides company, they give them a loan and, you know, they just want more and more of things and they sell more and more on loan and the farmers can't pay back and, you know, they end up selling their lands. And I just thought it was so true. And I just, I thought like it's 2020 and how can the world be, you know, in such a, such a crazy, like, you know, inhuman, it can run in such an inhuman way. So. Uh, just very next day, I, I got in touch. I was listening to a podcast. I heard of Rebecca Burgess uh, from Fiber Shed, uh, and I realized the things where she was speaking about with the Fiber Shed, that something in line like with what we were doing. And I approached her to see if she could give us a grant or support us in a way, uh, because at that time, like at 22, I don't really have funds. And she kind of helped us. Give, uh, they, she gave us a grant and connected us with our brand partners, Christy Don. And we started the first four acre project a regenerative farm project, which is basically like traditional ancient Indian farming techniques. So I used to, uh, there was a, a, a guru, a South Indian guru called Namalwar. I used to attend a lot of workshops. Uh, he's no more, but his workshop, workshops will continue. And I, I went to a lot of his workshops. I, I adopted those practices and then I realized, hey, this was uh, the regenerative uh, farming thing. So now we have like a complete seed to sow a supply chain where we work with and yeah. Yeah, as a collective. Amazing. Thank you, Nishat. I'm excited to dive in deeper of your personal story. Next, Dr. Shiva, would you mind giving us a brief intro of who you are in your work? Well, uh, you know, I, I did an MSc in particle physics uh, honors in uh, Punjab University when it was a peaceful and prosperous Punjab in the early 70s. And then I went to Canada to a, do a PhD in the foundations of quantum theory and uh, worked for a while on interdisciplinary research, worked for a while on foundations of quantum theory. Then I realized that the narrative didn't hang together. You know, the, uh, the idea that for the more science technology we have, the less poverty we'll have. I saw poverty grow, the more industrialization there was. And, um, and first I worked in the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore to try and solve this puzzle on science and technology, and then created an independent research foundation um, my, my mother gifted me her cow shed, which is where I'm sitting. This is where I was locked down. And it's so nice to be kind of back where my life was 40 years ago. Um, and it was during this period I was working for the United Nations University on a program on uh, peace and global transformation, conflicts over resources, and 84 happened in Punjab. And I said to the UNU, I got to study this as part of the conflict. What are the rules? This doesn't make sense. The narrative being told that it's about religion makes no sense. Because I didn't tell me it's about water. It's about prices. And so I did a study on the violence of the Green Revolution and that book, which is out from University of Kentucky in the United States and from Natraj in India and many other publishers. I did that book and then took a pledge. I'm going to commit myself to nonviolent farming with no idea at all of, about where it will take me. But I discovered then ecological agriculture, organic farming, all the scientific principles. And three years later, I find uh, at a meeting on biotechnology that the chemical companies, the Monsantos and Sipa Gaides, who are now the Syngentas, are saying we're not making enough money selling poisons. We've got to own the seed. And they talked about, this was 1987, they talked about genetic engineering being the route to patenting, which they would impose globally under the WTO trade-related intellectual property rights. So no farmer could ever save seeds again. And I said, A, you don't invent the seed, you can't have a patent. Two, you're criminalizing farmers for their duty. So I started Navdanya in 19, I started seed saving in 87, but became a, a entity called Navdanya, which means nine seeds in 1991. And that's what I've been doing, saving, and because 
Monsanto's BT Cotton introduced totally illegally. I sued them in 1999, 98. They came in illegally. I sued them in the Supreme Court. They couldn't sell commercially for four more years. And in that period, I watched cotton shifting from a mixed crop with jowar and bajri and bidharba and, uh, and mixed crop everywhere into BT cotton monocultures. And I watched the suicide start. And that's when I entered the seed saving. I mean, we've been doing seed saving on food crops, but then I started seed saving of cotton. And um, we've now, since this was in the mid 2000s, and, um, and every year we used to bring out this report called Seeds of Suicide, connecting debt, BT cotton, and farmer suicides. And the beautiful thing is since that time, besides all the seed saving we've done, uh, we've created community seed banks in Vidharva, which is the epicenter of farmer suicides. It's also where Gandhi started his ashram Seva Gram. And we work with the Gandhian ashrams on a fiber of freedom project. My work on Navdanya was inspired by the fact that Gandhi had pulled out a spinning wheel to fight the British Empire. And um, I thought very hard, what would be the spinning wheel of today? And I said, the seed. The seed is today's spinning wheel. So in a way, it came full circle where we connected back to the charkha and the spinning wheel of the Gandhi ashrams of Vidarbha. We do organic cotton seeds. We distribute them. We train farmers to do organic cotton. That organic cotton goes to the Gandhi ashrams who then hand spin, hand weave, and vegetable dye, the fibers of freedom. Um, now, of course, there's more work to be done, be not only because the farmer's crisis is deeper, but the instrumentalizing and structuring of the crisis is more accelerated. And also sadly, you know, I call them the poison cartel, the guys who came out of Hitler's labs, the IG Farben gang. All they know is how to kill people and how to kill insects and how to kill species and, uh, and make money while doing it. And now they want a farming without farmers. And uh, so that's my next work, uh, you know, to defend the farmers, not just in their justice, but to defend farmers as not becoming a species that goes extinct. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. And it's so wonderful to hear that your journey started in the beautiful Punjab, which leads us to Rupsi Garg, who is the di Associate Director of Kirti Verisif Mission. Rupsi, can you give us a brief overview of your work? Good evening, everyone. My name is Rupsi Garg. I am from Punjab, India, and I studied biotechnology. I passed BTEC in 2011 from Kurukshetra University, Haryana. And after that, I went to CCMB, Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology. It's a CSIR lab in Hyderabad. And I worked there for three years as a junior research fellow. But while working there, I realized that I don't want to continue and work in lab. I want to do something else. So that something else was at the grassroots level in the social sector. And I left CCMB. After that, I joined Ajim Premji University. It's in Bangalore. And I studied masters in development. So while I was studying in APU, I read about Green Revolution and how it has destroyed Punjab's ecology, Punjab's people's health, environmental health. And after that, I read Dr. Shiva's book called Monocultures of the Mind. So it moved me and I am also a Punjabi. So it made me think what is happening in Punjab. And I was away from home for um, seven, eight years. And uh, in the meantime, I started reading Mahatma Gandhiji. And his first book that I read was uh, Village Republic, Gram Savraj. So in that he talks about local production, local consumption, self-sufficiency. So he talks about Khadi, he talks about Charkha. And uh, uh, coincidentally, one of my friends went to Navdarshana. It's a community in Tamil Nadu. They do farming, they do 
workshops on uh, eco-friendly and sustainable practices and she attended a workshop by madhav ji on charkha uh, it was a spinning workshop and she brought that charkha to the hostel so i saw her doing that spinning and i asked her if she can teach me then she said there is nothing to teach in it you have to practice it yourself then she told me a little bit about that charkha and i started doing it when i did it so i could make that connect what i read in village republic and other writings of gandhi ji so it became a habit and i started spinning regularly so then i got to know about kheti virasat mission in punjab after third semester in second year uh, in apu we have uh, a field component so we have to do a field project i came here i worked with farmers organic farmers chemical farmers and i worked on a farm myself and uh, i felt very good because i could make a connect with people around language culture food habits and so many other things as well and at that time i decided to join kheti virasat mission i didn't take any campus placement and after completing the post graduation in 2018 i came to kvm and since last two and a half years i'm here and after coming here also i got organic cotton desi cotton because kheti virasat mission has been promoting organic farming since last 15 20 years so there are a good number of farmers who do desi cotton short staple organic cotton and then we have women who do its hand spinning so here also i found charkha and i could make that connect and then we started exploring in the villages and we tried to revive this full value chain from cotton to yarn to fabric and other traditional art and crafts also so we have an initiative called trinjan and trinjan is a punjabi word it symbolizes the sisterhood and right. um, and the connection that we have with each other with our environment with our culture so we have about 250 to 300 artisans associated with us and they are working in different villages we are working in three districts faridkot barnala and muktsar and i see a huge possibility in it it is not just uh, about the art it's a way of living and uh, it tells you what we are actually perfect thank Why you rupsi Yeah. yeah, I'm going to stop you there because I want to dive into deeper into Thringen and all your work throughout the work as we go through this panel. Um all of you touched on such important touch points in history as well as what's happening currently within the landscape of India from the green revolution to the modern farmer bills, but I want to take a step back and rewind a bit. Um and I want to talk about the beginnings of this shift where we had colonization. and in 1664 the east india company was created and one of the major goals was to subdue india's textile economy and so there was a plan a systemic plan created to subdue the indian farmer and make the switch from subsistence farming to cotton crop and this was a very pivotal point um not only would this eventually subject farmers to a cycle of interest laden debt it would also diminish the food supply Um India was to constantly supply the British mills with cotton being only the exporter of raw material only to be sold that cotton back at a premium which left our own spinners and weavers unable to afford that cotton. Uh, Britain became this workshop of the world and especially during the 19th century the US and British cotton relationship which was predicated on the use of slave labor in America also further diminished um india's textile economy so with that framing in mind dr shiva you have said that the rupture of oneness with the earth was a very deep construct and impact of colonialism so we know this to be true when it comes to the modes of agriculture and how our relationship with land and labor is so predicated on output 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 So I'd love to know how do you think colonialism has affected our modern day understanding of both land and labor? Um so yeah the East India Company as the name tells you was created to conquer India because India at that time was 25% of the world economy we were the world economy 
And we were the traders of the world for spices and textiles. And given that your platform is a fashion platform, you know, literally till globalization. For me, the poorest woman in the poorest village was walking fashion, you know, because we'd managed after independence to bring textiles back. You know, textile, uh, hand spinning and hand weaving had been totally crushed. And I want to read you a quote from my book, The Violence of the Green Revolution about the state that the East India Company uh, chartered by Queen Elizabeth in December, 1600. Yeah, 300 merchant adventurers, gangsters, gangsters of Europe got together, just like today the gangsters get together to create companies. And uh, of course, hijacked the entire spice trade, uh, totally colonized the land, and I'll come to that, but because you're a fashion group, 1864, it is evident that the whole population must be far near a state of pristine nudity than ever before. This is India of the textiles. Huh? Every poor person stints himself to an inconceivable degree in his clothing and every purpose to which cotton is applied. He wears his turban and breech cloth to rags, dispenses with his body clothing and denies himself his annual renewal. So we were taken from the biggest economy of the world to one of the poorest 2% of the world economy by the British left. How did colonialism change land and labor? We never believed in property in land. Even now at the farmers protest, they keep talking about the mother as or the, the soil as their mother and what they're fighting for is their bond with her. Uh, so the British, colonialism was a mega, mega, mega land grab. Not just in India, uh, you know, the peasant lands were taken and became colonial lands. And then the British appointed zamidars. And the brilliant, and this is something you should look at. We have two volumes of the ecological history of food and farming. Because in the Northwest provinces, as it was called, the farmers protest started immediately with this extraction of Lagan, the rent. And, um, and I have links to Sir Chotu Ram, who was the governor at that time of the Northwestern provinces. But the farmers protesting today were farmers who fought against the British Zamidari and state owner cultivators. They were never working for landlords or were never landlords hiring other labor. But the East India was turned to Zamidari, was pushed to famines. And um, so the land relationship was not totally alienated. And the Land Alienation Act of Northwestern provinces kept the Punjab farmer a proud independent farmer, which is why they've risen again and again and again. So they made land their property and collected rents called Lagan. $45 trillion dollars was transferred by the British. Where did the Lagan come from? From the farmers. What was this 45 trillion of wealth transferred to England? The creativity, productivity of the land and the creativity and productivity of the farmer. 45 trillion of this wealth was transferred by the colonial system. And the peasants who created that wealth were pushed to famine, 60 million famine deaths during the British period. Of course, they then created the fabric of theorizing what science is Bacon, what property is Locke, what politics is Hobbes. I mean, I want to do a bonfire of these big white men's lives because they brainwashed so many generations of people. And Adam Smith writes this book on the wealth of nations which is really about the theft from nations. And he talks about it being in our DNA to be greedy and take away from others. No, it's in our DNA to protect the earth, share. Look at the lungers on the streets where the farmers are protesting, the giving of food. This is not about grabbing, it's about giving. So how was land changed? It was turned into property, but of the colonizer. And the original non-prop, they were, they were custodians. They were left destitute. 
But land was also turned into an inert dead matter. And all the theorizing of the Bacons of that time was the earth is dead matter. So not only did it take life, the, you know, take away resources of the presence, it took away life from the land. And my life's work for the last so many decades, 50 years now, has been to show how capitalist patriarchy totally redefined our relationship with the earth and our perception of ourselves. Our bodies were also turned into inert raw material. And our only work was as slaves. But if you think, you know, and the narrative that was built, it was the mills of Lancashire and uh, Manchester that created the wealth of England. No, they were colonizing 200 years before those mills came. And the empire was an empire of cotton for which they grabbed all of the land of the indigenous people of the Americas, turned it into cotton plantations. But because it was so much, they then had to capture Africans and slaves and do tell the Black Lives Matter movement that it is time to create a global unity against colonialism. It is not just a problem of one group of people on one piece of land, it's a global problem. And we are connected through cotton being turned from the thread of prosperity to a thread of slavery. In terms of labor, this I think is the big deconstruction that has to be done, the decolonization of work. The earth was reduced to land as an inert input, and we were reduced to labor as a commodity to be sold. I'm not going to go into depth because so much has been written about alienation of labor, about extraction of surplus value, the entire edifice of inequality, exploitation, extraction, both from the earth and from people. And sadly, because we've inherited those definitions as if they are Bibles written by Christ himself or Moses, 10 commandments, um, people still think within those categories. So people are taking it as inevitable. Even though Gandhi totally challenged the idea of industrialization with the spinning wheel, people are taking it as inevitable that artificial intelligence and robotics is going to destroy all work and 99% humanity will be useless. Now is the time for the spinning wheel in every hand, the seed in every hand. Decolonization means the colonizer's agenda must be challenged with another imagination. Incredibly power, Dr. Shiva. And I love the way you talk about those interlinked oppressions from the forced removal of indigenous folks in the Americas, um, enslaved Africans to what was happening in India during this time of the British Raj. I also love the idea of this discord of seeing humans once we are nature, we, were, we weren't nature, we are nature, but this discord that created this human nature divide was also key to all of this. You concluded on the idea of the Turka and the spinning wheel. Um, and for those that are not familiar, during the fight for independence against the British Raj, a key tool of resistance became Khadi. And so Rupsi, I know your work deals a lot with the Jarka and Khadi. So I would love if you could give us a brief history on how Khadi and the Jarka was used as a tool of resistance. What did that look like exactly? Yeah, so for me, Jarka is not just making yarn out of cotton. It's a way of living and it tells you about your life, lifestyle, what values we inherit through charkha. As the charkha keeps revolving, our life is also revolving around it. And it talks about the cultural associations that we have among human beings and with our environment, our physical environment, our ecological environment, all these things. So if I go to villages these days, I can see those connecting links. There are farmers, there are different kinds of artisans. They are spinners, they are weavers, they are blacksmithers, they are carpenters. So village as a unit and how these different chains, these different links are connected to each other. They are dependent on each other, but still they have their own independence. So during British Raj, this Khadi, Khadi is not just about the fabric. It is about our way of living in each sphere that we are 
able to produce that much that we are able to fulfill our own needs and we have some surplus also so in punjab also what i have observed in last two and a half years there is that skill but that skill is not valued anymore because the social structure is broken there is a disconnection with our immediate environment so there are women who can spin who can weave but all these women are in their old age they are like 60 years 70 years and some are 80 years old so this younger generation is not taking it up and for them it becomes a monotonous and uh, tedious work and the idea of economic prosperity that green revolution also brought in you know so do we only want economic prosperity i think we need to question it to ourselves what about the other values in life being a satisfied person you know there is uh, there are needs and wants so first can we identify our needs so all these thing goes back to the british raj and how we have got these ideas and uh, these perspectives in our mind so at this moment i feel our villages are an independent unit and if we relook our villages there is a lot there are huge possibilities and we will get to know about ourselves also great great amazing and i think it's important to note that during the fight for british independence you know gandhi and the larger khadi or swadeshi movement or made in india was rooted in burning british made goods and it returned to self reliance the village economy this ruralization of our economies and not depending on those factors um i'm going to fast forward a bit because dr shiva and rupsi garg you have both um pointed to the green revolution a lot in what you've talked about this far Um so fast forward to the 1960s and 1970s a critical juncture in India's agriculture sector was the green revolution and Dr Shiva for those that are not familiar can you give a brief overview of what the green revolution was for its benign name um and what its impacts were that were not so green <laughs> So you know there was no green politics at that time the the word green did not mean ecology green was just a different color from red and the americans were very scared of red <laughs> so uh, they just wanted a different name uh, the green revolution was not green it was not revolutionary it was basically an attempt being made ever since the wars ended to take war chemicals the chemical fertilizers were basically made at, uh, in the same labs and same factories in which Hitler, the explosives were made the same ig farben made nitrogen fertilizers and made explosives um and the same process um all of the pesticides are derivatives of xylon b and poison gases that were made again for hitler's concentration camps and for the wars so after the wars were ended instead of just folding up and saying we'll shut these factories they had got so addicted to making huge money and Rachel Carson has written about it in her book uh, Silent Spring um Howard uh, Albert Howard has written about it in his book An Agricultural Testament that uh, those who had got addicted to making money out of selling chemicals uh continued to sell them now as agrochemicals so the big issue was they wanted to sell fertilizers and chemicals the problem was uh you know satyagraha is gandhi's word for non cooperation based on truth and what when chemicals were applied to our native varieties of seeds which were tall because they were dual purpose the straw gave food for the animals and the grain gave food for us so we created dual purpose animals milk from the cows and animal energy from the bullocks and dual purpose crops to feed the animals including human animals but when you apply chemicals to these tall crops they lodge if there's wind or too much rain and this problem of lodging was the big problem so they kept trying ford foundation rockefeller foundation 
And then Norman Borlaug, who worked for DuPont Defense Lab, was put on the job of changing the plant to adapt to the chemicals rather than adapt the farming techniques to the native seeds. And that's why he created the dwarf varieties. And these dwarf varieties were misleadingly called high yielding varieties. How can less be more? You know? And when I did my Green Revolution book, my eyes would tell me, here's a lie, but my science will tell me, bigger lie, these were not high yielding variety. They were high chemical demanding varieties, high response varieties, but they needed 10 times more water to grow the same amount of food. And that's the root of the water crisis of Punjab for which the farmers are being blamed, but it was imposed on them. There were conditionalities put. If you couldn't show you had taken chemicals, you couldn't take a loan to send your daughter to college. Credit conditionalities on the farmer and on India, credit conditionalities from the World Bank. All of this also meant these short varieties came with mechanization and just the top of the grain was picked up by the harvester and the stubble was left and they told the farmer, burn the stubble. And now they told the farmer, use your water, use the chemicals. They told the farmer, burn the stubble. And now they want to fine farmers 20 million rupees each for doing what they were told to do. So one of the demands of the farmers right now is this should not be criminalized. So the Green Revolution, what did it end up doing? And it was prescribed by the World Bank. It was conditionality. 65, we had a drought. The prices of wheat went up slightly. And those days we used to, under rupee payment, import a little extra rye wheat from uh, US. It was called the PL Poiti. And Lal Bahadur Shastri asked for a little more wheat to stabilize prices. No one was dying of hunger and famine. There was no famine in India in 65. I was in school and I remember. Prices rose up, sugar was a problem. And uh, the US said, sorry, we won't send you wheat unless you change your agriculture and use chemicals. And Shastri said, I will not experiment with such a large agrarian population. Uh, we can do it on a small scale and if it works, we'll adopt it. And then Lal Bahadur Shastri died in Tashkent, the pressure continued and the green revolution was imposed by 91, we had structural adjustment because the debt of the Green Revolution for dams, for irrigation, for uh, chemicals, for, um, for the whole system. Now, actually, the system that was created was only P Punjab. If you think of it, Aditi, so during British time, the Punjab farmers refused to become serfs and stayed owner cultivators. By the time Green Revolution came, they said, we got to build on the best because this wasn't a destroyed agriculture. And then they started, started to destroy it. And as a result of that, by 1984, the farmers of Punjab resisting, 84 was a peasant movement. The narrative was changed, but it was a farmer's movement. And the farmers were saying, and I have it written here, the Shirumuni, you know, there was a declaration, I think the Gurmat Khasla said, if the hard earned income of the people or the natural resources of any nation or region are forcibly plundered, the goods produced by them are paid at arbitrarily determined prices, while the goods bought by them are sold at high prices. And in order to carry this process of economic exploitation to its logical conclusion, the human rights of people or of a nation are crushed, then these are indices of slavery of that nation, region, or people. Today, the six are shackled by chains of slavery. This type of slavery is thrust upon the states and 80% of India's population of poor people and minority. And we mustn't forget, my mother herself became a refugee. She, you know, she had studied in Lahore and was working in Lahore, and then the partition happened. The partition left only Sikh farmers. Earlier, there used to be a mixture because of the Sikhs moved this side and the Muslims moved that side. So the farmers of Punjab are Sikhs. And they communalized the farmers' protests. And every narrative, if you look at it, 84 story is never told in terms of the farmers. 4th of June, the farmers of Punjab are going to blockade the supply of grain to Delhi. 
They had blockaded the governor's house. They were going to blockade the trains. So the Green Revolution brought 84. Then the 91 is a buildup of the new reforms. And maybe we can come back to that on another round. I can quickly tell you that 80, 30% of the debt of 91, the 90 billion debt, was caused by the Green Revolution. And that then started to push new reforms, they call it, yeah, which is basically create a crisis, use it as an opportunity to expand your control and your market. And I want to show you just two images. So in 2000, I did a public hearing on farmer suicides. This was in Bangalore. This is a sick farmer who had come, whose brother has committed suicide because of debt. And that's not all. In 2006, this is still in my heart. It's still, I still carry this pain. You know, usually in Punjab, everyone's with a colorful turn and all the women are in colorful chunis. This is all white. 2,000 widows in a Gurdwara in Batinda giving evidence to us. We were on a jury, a public jury of a public trial. 2,000 widows. And all of them said, and then he took the spray, as a spray, thing, you know, in Punjabi, a spray, yeah, the poison spray. They took the spray that got them into debt for the BT cotton. They were all BT cotton farmers. Vidharba suicides, Batinda suicides, all connected through the poison cartel. And what we are seeing on the streets of Delhi or all over the country today with the Bharat Bam is a continuation of this exploitation. And to me, this is genocide. I've said it, I've been trolled by the Monsantos of the world, but when you deliberately harm a community and farmers are a community and you cause harm to the extent that 400,000 of them have to commit suicide, this is genocide and it has to stop. And I hope your networks will play their role to create another economy through a new solidarity. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. I want to pivot to you, Nishant. Um, you said you grew up in Tamil Nadu where your parents had a large textile factory and you saw the adverse effects of industrial manufacturing from polluted rivers, smog, infertility rates to cancer. Um, when you returned from college abroad, you decided you wanted to change this. So I would love for you to talk about how Oshadi is reimagining the supply chain, one, to be more equitable, and if you could talk on specific issues like contract farming um, and how you've imagined a full supply chain, that would be great. You're muted. <laughs> so yeah, when I got back from the university, I that was the first time, you know, I become serious, you know, uh, before I go, I was like 17 years old and you know, I was a bit childish. So I get back 22, I just look at the textile industry and I actually did a big course on sustainability while I was at the university. And I came back and I looked at uh, through my educational perspective and I realized how biased the world is. Like, you know, especially humans, they have like different ways of looking at things. So when they look at their own child, you know, they have a completely different outlook on things. And when they look at someone else and I, I saw so many rivers were polluted, I read that every third, 13th person in my hometown has has cancer or likely to get cancer and the biggest businesses here are like the infertility clinics and I also saw like how uh, a government or like an organization decides what a minimum wage is and they end up paying like 250 bucks to a farmer when you pay 250 rupees to a farmer it is uh, it's like 7500 rupees a month which is what can you do with 7,500 rupees a month? Like you barely get through your life. You barely pay, pay, your, pay your rents. You barely, uh, you know, get, eat good food. How can you like in India, education is not, you know, monetized by government, Educate, healthcare is not. So they definitely need to save up something. I was just like so disturbed by this biased look of this world on, you know, different groups of people, like a certain seg segment of people just, controlling thousands and thousands of workers, you know, deciding what a minimum wage for them is or deciding, you know, how they could be polluted. And I, I was just so surprised that, you know, government has not, not criminalized this pollution of rivers, which is like you see thousands and thousands of fishes like dead and, you know, all this like poultry, millions and millions of chickens, you know, in one small space. And I was just like really disturbed for a couple of years and I was really furious about this. And I decided that 
uh, I think it's enough of complaining and maybe start like a small impact, even if it's tiny, at least I played my part in doing that. And we started uh, firstly working with the, with the, with the artisans and to, you know, finding out like a new income level. So we used to also work with like a lot of brands and the system, the rate, like, you know, when we started doing the farming, we figured out the rates for different things like the farm, the, the sowing, the thing, all the rates are completely like low. I can't believe like government like says it's 280 rupees is a minimum wage. Like I, just because a privileged person has the right to decide that doesn't mean that's like a right system. So I just realized the entire system was like completely screwed. It's just like wrong things are being taught through the system, like through spinning, through farmers, like a farmer's earning 250 bucks, like we pay them 350 rupees, which is really low, like, you know, compared to what our standards are, but if you do take it like higher brands won't buy stuff from at the current rates for a farmer, are like 200 bucks, 225 rupees a day. And I was just like, how can you get through life? Like without a thousand rupees a day, you can't get through life. You can't save up something for your kid's education. The kids then become like recluse when they grow up without parents, like, you know, taking care of them. They come out as rebels, not rebels with like, you know, with a cause, but they just come and destroy things. And, you know, like, it's just like, it's good. It's a cause and effect. And we, we started working with like brands and, you know, we figured out a supply chain. We made our own rates. We didn't look at the system, what the rates were. We worked backward. We saw like how much the farmers, how, how much uh, would they work to, you know, get this income. And then we, we, we finalized the cotton rate based on what the yield was. So the cotton rate, how can it be consistent? Let's say you have one season of drought. How can the cotton rates still be the same? It just doesn't make sense. And we realized, okay, we go backward, we figure out how many meters of uh, fabric does a brand want. And then we go backwards from that, then just have an estimate saying that, hey, we would do like 10 acres and you'd have this many meters of fabric, but that is not guaranteed. It can be 20% up, 20% lesser, 20%, it could be anything, but that's the thing you get into. That's kind of a system you, uh, we can get into and figure things out. And fortunately we had brand partners who supported us, support us to make that happen. And that way we just, uh, change the rate. So all the seamstresses who work with us, they get like at least thousand rupees a day. All the weavers who work with us, they get the similar wages, like thousand rupees. I don't think anywhere, like I've visited so many uh, handloom places around India, like in Gujarat, uh, in, in Viterba, in, in, you know, like all the income rates, like I see so many brands working with artisanal companies, like they've been working with these companies for 50 years, like hundred years. And why is the artisan still poor? Like, why is he still in the hut? Like, you know, why can't he afford like right education for his kids or, you know, why does he? So it's the system's based on like suppressing, like, you know, making slaves and it's like colonization, as you said. And I think Indians themselves, like, you know, going through this process have come to a colonized mindset where now it's Indians colonizing Indians, just like through businesses or through systems or the rates and all these government policies and things like that. Yeah, and you pointed to the fact that, you know, farmers are expected to create a certain yield, but farmers are often picking up all of the risk, especially in an age where weather conditions, and there's so many conditions that they're faced with. So I know you have a model where brands actually lease the land from the farmers, if I'm not mistaken. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, so uh, as I said uh, just before, uh, we work with brands, we, we figure out what is the kind of fabric they would want to make or what is the type of garment they would want to make. And then it's just an estimate of what the general quantities are. So we have a, uh, we have an agreement with the brand uh, saying that, hey, this is the quantity, but it can go up or do, go down based on the yields. And a lot of the farms are like chemically farmed. So, you know, it's, it takes like a few years for it to switch into organic farms. So the yield might go down for a year or two, or sometimes the yield is like fantastic and first year because there's already existing salts from before and you know the second time it goes here so you know the brands we we were fortunate to have it like christy down they 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 realize they they were okay you know we 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 never gave them a base price or you know base like this is it we told them this is what it would take to change the land this is what it takes to have cover crops in the crops pollinator strips and all of these things are a part of regenerative farming but basically when you just look at those things regenerative farming is traditional Indian farming thing so the model we had was from this person who used to work for Namalwar uh, and like this person he had like he gave us a model and I was looking at like hey there's like green gram there or there's this caster on the outside or there's jowar on 
as a border crop or this is as like a poll pollinator strip. And I was like, so surprised. I was like, it has such close similarity and it is, you know, regenerative farming. And as uh, Vandana Jesus said, like, you know, you have these like tall crops, they act as like, uh, food for uh, the cattle here and you know the, the the top part of it like the jar act like food for the parrots or like the birds which come in so they don't come in to come and pluck into the cotton plants and you know there's this insects and they feed on these cover crops and trap crops and you know it's, it's small ecosystem you create like you know through we have like something called life fencing where like you know we create fences not with barbed wires but with these like trees which are like really closely planted and you see like this entire thing and we never like since we started doing that, we actually have less or no pest attack whatsoever. We have like really minimal maintenance and really less water levels, like, you know, uh, water requirement for these things. Uh, but yeah, this is the setup we had for the farm. That's brilliant. And I think it really speaks to the fact that, you know, we've seen the rise of this narrative of regenerative agriculture, which is great. But I think it's also really important to note that we are not reinventing the wheel when it comes to the growing movement around sustainability. Sustainability at its core is going back and following the lead of cultures and practices that have always had a symbiotic relationship with this earth. Um, being mindful of the time, this panel is flying by. Um, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge what is currently happening in India with the farmer protests, which is now being called the largest organized strike in the history of the world with over 250 million participants. And so currently, farmers across India are protesting three agricultural bills. These bills promise liberalizations, but in reality, farmers will face the privatization of the agricultural sphere. Um, there is a lot of resources online that one can read into if you're interested in learning more because, again, want to be mindful of time. But Dr. Shiva, as someone who has been an ardent supporter of small farmers as the key to sustainability and biodiversity, um, and you've been a champion against the corporatization of this sphere and corporate monopoly, what are your thoughts on the current situation and where do we go from here? One, I've just put my analysis that I did for a newspaper on, on the three laws, as well as the books and some videos of the 90s and nine, the protests of the earlier days, where the fathers and grandfathers of those who are leading the protests today used to march with us. 500,000 farmers in Bangalore at Kaban Park, um, 200,000. You know, right, right now, Rakesh Tiket is on the streets, but his dad, Mahindra Singh Tiket, used to uh, be with us and uh, 200,000 at Red Fort um, to say to the government that agriculture is too precious. It's about culture, it's about life, it's about food, it's about livelihood. It is not about trade in commodities. Now the three laws were actually, uh, the substance of these were crafted by the World Bank as part of the structural adjustment of 1991. World Bank has been trying very hard to get rid of the Central Commodities Act, which we put in place in 1955, after the Great Bengal Famine of 42, which killed 2 million people. And it's all because the British were extracting and hoarding and trading and commodifying. People had grown the rice, there was enough rice, but 2 million people died because the British took the rice uh, to make profits during those periods. And, uh, and the women started a movement called Tibhaga. Uh, the second law, so it was, it's being dismantled, you know, it's been changed to say, you, you can hoard, you can profit, you can, and the government won't set a price unless it becomes such a crisis. But if that's, it's a crisis, then you can't really do anything about it. The second is dismantling the system that allowed the market their grain. Now, let me take you back to the Green Revolution. Here's the Green Revolution that says Punjab will grow grain for everyone else and it will only be rice and wheat. And rice is not a Punjab crop, but they were forced to grow rice. Uh, and now it should supply the whole country. 40% of the supply of food of India today, especially the public distribution system, is now grown by the farmers. Now this grain had to be brought somewhere so the government could pick it up and supply it around the country. These were called the mandis. So the current act is in effect trying to hand over the trade 
to the giant corporations. The difference between 91, when the big corporations were the Cargill for grain and the Monsantos, the difference is today we have our own giants who all have partnership with global giants. They don't work alone. I mean, suddenly out of the blue, a reliance cannot become a digital company without the help of Microsoft and Gates. They cannot become a grain company or Adani can't become a grain company overnight. So they are becoming the front, just like when Monsanto entered, they entered behind Mahiko. They always find an Indian partner to hide behind. And the current protests are against the third law. So one is dismantling of the Essential Commodities Act, which means totally deregulated prices and a recipe for famine. This doesn't affect the farmer as much as the country and the poor. The second is dismantling the regional system where states decided and the, there were cooperatives of farmers and small traders and there was a stock limit that that goes and the big giants can go by. But the third is the contract law. Now, all these three they've been trying to put in place since 91, but I, I always smile at the COVID, you know, the little virus. I say so many racketeers hid behind you, COVID, to do things they could not do when democracy was vibrant. But the beauty of the protest today is in spite of the lockdown, millions of farmers have shown how a vibrant democracy can look. So how did the contract farming begin? This will be interesting to you, Aditi, that it actually began back again with the crisis of Punjab. And here's the ad that our dear Pepsi put. What did they call it? Today, Punjab has the promise of a hundred years of spring on Baisakhi day. They started to try and get in from 86 onwards. The crisis is 84, 86 they try. They're given approval in 88. The entire system is changed for multinational entry. A new ministry is created for food processing. And to understand what farmers are against, let me give you a figure of Pepsi. So all of, one of Pepsi's projects and contracts totally failed in Punjab. We've done many studies on this. They brought potato and they brought tomato. They pay farmers of Punjab 50 paisa. Farmers couldn't survive. And then they'd collect 10 rupees from the government to export ketchup. And they weren't allowed to enter in the name of Lays. They used to call it Leher in those days because of some restrictions. <laughs> potato, they moved out of Punjab, but they went all over their suicides of, among farmers of potato, locked into contract with Pepsi. Pepsi gets pay, makes you pay 20 rupees for a junk food package. Farmer gets 0 0.04 rupees, four paise for the potato in that junk food package. And then they tried to sue. I was part of writing the laws for India. I worked with parliament on the patent law. The, uh, the agriculture minister invited me to draft the farmer's rights law. We are the only country in the world that has a law, the Plant Variety Protection and Farmer's Rights Act. And we put a clause, Article 39, that farmers are breeders, therefore, and their right to save, exchange, improve, sell seed can never be taken away. Pepsi sued four potato farmers of Gujarat last year for 40 million rupees. I sent this book to the lawyers and the judges, the book which has these uh, laws, and uh, Pepsi had to withdraw that case. But the farmers are totally rightfully rejecting these laws and they keep saying their farmers are afraid. Farmers are afraid. No, farmers have experienced since 1991 the corporate hijack of their share of what the consumer pays, whether it's in clothing or it's in food. And they also know that if this down, and the prices have gone like this, you know, with globalization, the price the farmer gets is going like this, the price the consumer pays goes up. And the Arab Spring was actually a bread riot because the food prices had jumped up. Now farmers know if this system of deregulated commerce is pushed and no regulation is there, these prices are going to collapse and they won't be able to survive. And they're fighting for survival. And I'm totally behind them because this I say is a fight for the soul of India.
It is a fight for the civilization and its values that has consciously stayed agrarian in spite of repeated attempts to dismantle our agrarian soul and leave us both desertified in terms of the soil and desertified in terms of our soul. So we are in a very, very critical juncture. And uh, I've seen too many tricks played over these decades of work I've been doing. And I just hope all the strength stays with the farmers who have shown their strength so long. And they continue to say it's either yes to our demand of repeal the laws or a no, in which case we will not go home till you repeal the laws. Incredibly powerful. And I have a call to, audi call to action for the audience is amid this age of corporate monopoly and corporate hegemons and how all of that ties into media, please amplify what is currently happening on the ground in India on your platforms if you can. Um, I feel like a repetitive, a repetitive theme throughout this conversation was this intersection between culture, identity, and ecological sustainability. Um, Rupsi, when I first came across your work with Kirti Virasat Mission, it was through a documentary that they had put out. You could find the link in the chat about Trinjan. And I am a Punjabi woman, and despite being a part of the diaspora, one thing that had always connected me to my culture was growing up learning about bolis and giddas, the songs, the dance, the folklore that frame our relationship to the land, to womanhood, to each other. And so I would love if you could briefly talk about the work of Drinjin and how that is tied to Kadi, as well as the movement for organic farming in Punjab. Yeah, so as it was talked earlier about the BT cotton. So in Faridkot, we are in Malwa belt of Punjab. And this Malwa belt was known as cotton belt. And now this cotton is replaced by a paddy. And there are a lot of suicides in this cotton belt. Bathinda, Muktsar, Fazilka, Faridkot, Barnala. All these districts come under this cotton belt. Because in the cotton, a lot of pesticides and chemical fertilizers are used. And where the consumption of pesticides and fertilizers are high, the suicides are also high. So this area was known for cotton cultivation. And that cotton cultivation was not just restricted to the farmers, that it is being produced and it is sold. But it had a complete value chain after cotton production. It was manually picked, it was ginned, it was carded, it was hand spun in the houses. And almost every house had a charkha, a loom, and it's after processing. So when we started identifying all these links, we found that there is a great heritage that we don't know about. So when I came to KVM, I started talking to women because Kheti Virasat Mission works with 5,000 women through organic kitchen gardening. Organic kitchen gardening is a project or is an initiative that talks about nutritional and health security at the household level. Because we all know without women, any family, any society, any nation is incomplete. So this organic farming movement is also incomplete without women. So women have to get involved. And due to green revolution and its consequences, which is high mechanization, machinery, and market, women did not find much space, especially in Punjab. In other parts of the country, there are women working in farms. They are farmers. But in Punjab, it is not the case. So how to bring women back? So through organic kitchen gardening, we could bring women back and they cultivate organic seasonal vegetables in their houses. So they are conserving their own seeds also, vegetable seeds. That is how seed conservation, seed heritage is also preserved. And when I started talking to these women, then they said, we used to do all these things in our houses. And all these dharis, dharis are drugs that are made for the daughters when daughters get married. So they used to make nine dharis, 11 dharis, 15 dharis for their daughters. And each of these dharis has a name, you know, in Punjabi. So whatever they saw in their surrounding, be it a parrot, 
beat a chidiya beat a tree and they even made a bride and groom on that dari so it is their imagination and it is their creativity so what i have started feeling that women don't just produce they create they make creations you know so all these things made me think about my internal journey i am also a woman so what it means to be a woman how we maintain our relationship what i have the responsibilities being a daughter being a sister and maybe being a wife uh, i'm going to become tomorrow so all these things made a connect with the culture with the relationships and we call trinjan is weaving the social fabric with compassionate work and dedicated web i repeat it it is not just about the production it is not just making yarn and fabric and selling it yeah it is an opportunity for employment but more than the employment it is about the social warp and weft jo samaj ka tana bana hai see our society is also closely woven closely knitted and we have our values our customs our rituals so many things in that so trinjan talks about weaving that social fabric with compassionate warp and dedicated web because it is not just the crisis of farming not about the art it is a civilizational crisis it is a crisis of our identity our existence so how do we first understand it and then address it so traditional art and craft and its revival was the starting point for trinjan and organic cotton we found a backbone uh, where we started from and then these women artisans because they talk about the womanhood their challenges and struggles in life and how they manages how they manage all these things around them so trinjan is a platform where people can come together it is not just specific to women because at the moment at the moment we are working with women so that is why it is coming again and again but we are trying to work with children with younger generation also who are interested so trinjan becomes a platform where people can come together they can share their happiness their sorrowness whatever they want to share and it goes to the next generation because earlier we did not have these schools any coaching centers where our children would go and learn all this knowledge was getting transferred in the household itself where a mother is living her daughter would also start weaving and now also when trinjan started we could see that small kids 8 year old 9 year old they have started weaving and they are making small dairies you know they are making a jugaad they are arranging something from here and there so initially we heard from people that we burnt our charkha because it was just a piece of wood it was uh, it was not uh, symbolizing anything else and when we asked about the loom they said we sold it to a kabadi wala because there is a iron frame for that loom so you can see that this disconnect and uh, that disassociation with our own things what we should value what is precious to us and nowadays what has come to it what has it become so all these things are crucial to us and in trinjan we are trying to emphasize the intrinsicness okay there is an external value also there is an aesthetic there is marketing aspect there is employment aspect but what a charkha and a loom can give you internally here i would like to talk about a person his name is baba ronki ram ji he is from jalandhar district uh, near lpu fagwada uh, there is a village i am not uh, uh, remembering his village name he is 71 years old and he is from a traditional julaha family julaha means a weaver family and we got to know about him we went to meet him and when i asked him uh, what is weaving for you you know what he replied 
मेरे लिए वीविंग प्रभु का नाम लेना है मतलब वीविंग इज वर्शिपिंग द गोड इट इज नॉट जस्ट मेकिंग अ फैब्रिक एंड समथिंग लाइक दैट सो ही इज द ओनली वीवर लेफ्ट इन दैट विलेज so we are trying to connect those dots that are still existing okay we have lost everything that is fine but what we have let's preserve it let's collect its seeds when the right time will come it will be able to grow germinate and spread so through trinjan we are trying to connect all these things Rupa say that is so beautiful and I think it speaks to so many things. This is not just about the charkha or the spinning wheel. This is about culture, a way of life. You know, when you do the spinning wheel, it's inherently meditative. And the way it was done was usually in a communal way, so it was a form of knowledge transfer as he spoke about and I think that is also powerful. Um Nishant, I know that you are very passionate about correcting the industry's narrative around Indian artisans. Um, a lot of the narrative around India, especially in the sustainable fashion scene, has been about rescuing people. Um, so I'd love your thoughts on how you are kind of using Oshadi Collective and your work at large to kind of change that narrative. Uh, I think everyone around the world knows India has uh, exceptional craftsmanship. All the luxury brands, ready-to-wear brands around the world, like you know, they work. They most of their work relies on. indian embroiders or like craftsmen and you know it never goes out like you know it never uh, it's never told as a true story and you know when someone's working like i know organizations like harris street in the uk and many more organizations in france and when they speak about the work there they speak about oh exceptional craftsmanship and this it takes so much time to weave that it probably takes more time to weave that in india you know because they make more intricate work here and when they put indian work in the limelight it it comes out as like helping a poor person or you know like supporting like a some like a person or helping someone or sh- sympathizing with that and i completely was dismayed by the sympathizing thing you know when they looked at me or like when they looked at an artisan that hey we are like helping you and i was like no you're not helping us we are working together like we are partnering and we are helping you you are helping us it's it's a it's an exchange and it's not like someone you know it's just it's just like a completely different perspective it it shouldn't come come out of sympathy it has to come out of compassion and the work the artisans do like uh, one of the best works and all the embroideries all the stuff you know we've been doing it's always taken in the you know in the wrong, wrong limelight and through oshadi we we always wanted to show that it's not sympathizing with the artisan is the skill you know like you know i'm able to sit here and speak to you guys or you know there's another brand making millions of dollars on another side of the world or you know it doesn't come from sympathy it comes from hard work it comes from skills and it comes from respect for all those skills and you know not showing a downside uh you see like photos like everyone all the brands who uh, most brands who, who work with them they show like photos of these poor people wearing no shirts or like you know just coming in and you know giving a helping hand and you know things like that i think the perspective has to change it has to be like connecting with each other and instead of helping or like partnering or collaborating with each other and you know coming together as one looking at everyone as like not just having like a biased outlook i think humans tend to have such biased outlook when they look at others they look at someone who's not wearing a shirt or like who's just doing his work in his own way i think uh with oshadi i i actually like you know when when i when i sit down in most like of like if you go to india and sit down in anyone's household on a dining table you wouldn't see like a worker or like a cook sitting on the same table and having lunch or like a driver like he would just stand outside and he won't have the lunch and this is like deeply troubling issue you know it's feeded into subconscious of kids when they grow up uh you know i probably learned that and you know when i go abroad and come back and i was like man this is so wrong like you know there's someone who's not able to sit on the same table and she cooks food three times a day she's working 16 hours a day to keep the home clean or you know to have like good food and i think like i was like really disturbed by this biased outlook actually like i i listened to a podcast i heard this story about this rat i keep telling this story uh uh you know repeating this where uh, this parent uh, the, the, this family has a white rat as a pet and they take care of it like really well and you know when the when the rat grows old and it passes away the family moans and they are deeply sad about that and few years down the line it's about the same family and they they see a rat like you know eating on their cheese or something and they kill the rat 
So you see the perspective, like, you know, it's the same rat. It's just like a rat because they have like raised or, you know, they've had as a pet. They, they you know, take care of it. They mourn the dead. They, you know, have the ceremony, like they, they bury it and stuff. And when they see another rat, they try to kill it. So I think that kind of bias outlook uh, is what we, uh, I, I personally, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I work towards empowering that or like you know not just empowering that but telling it in the right way uh and honest way and in, in real way then you know in like a facade or sympathizing thing i love that and everyone needs to check out oshadi collective from the way they are weaving this narrative to the visuals i think it provides a very powerful example of what decolonized storytelling looks like that isn't rooted in this predatory gaze that reinforces certain power structures Again, being mindful of time, I'm going to ask our last question uh, for you, Dr. Shiva. And that is about, again, we're at this critical juncture between COVID-19, the farmer protests. I think 2020 in many ways was the year where it has become more explicit than ever that our systems are not working for both people and the planet. So to close, I would love if you could share your insights on how the future of an equitable society rooted in sustainability requires a decolonization, which means we're gonna go back to this intersection between ecology, culture, identity. So what are your parting words of advice for everyone in this space of how we can move forward um, between all of those intersections? I never give advice. <laughs> it's a bit too arrogant to give other people advice. But what I've learned through my life is first, you know, from my quantum theory days, a, there's nothing like things. People are not things. Fabric is not thing. Food is not stuff. Everything has the potential to be living and the giver of life. Uh, and everything is inseparable. We are all interconnected. I've done a recent book on this called Oneness Versus the One Percent. It's available from Chelsea Green in the United States and from Women Unlimited in India and other publishers around the world. Um, what I see happening is, you know, my analysis of COVID is you've invaded into the forest, you've unleashed pandemic after pandemic because you've robbed animals of their homes and their viruses which were safe in the forest and on animals are now becoming epidemic diseases from the Ebola's to the HIV's to the SARS and now the COVID. So it is really a symptom of a relationship gone wrong, a relationship gone wrong with the earth. And this is how we have to address it, except that those who made a lot of money out of the mechanical mind, an extractivist economy can't give up that habit very easily. You know, in a way, it's, you know, I, I think it's like an addiction and they do need de-addiction. For me, decolonization is de-addiction to colonizing. Um, and they're now looking for every opportunity to colonize more. My book, Oneness One Versus One Percent, and a recent report we've done on gates to a global empire, um, is that here are all these initiatives rising that we have shared this evening. I'm so happy. Namalwar was a dear, dear friend, and we built the organic movement of India together. And um, Umendra Dath, who started Kethi Virasat, volunteered with Navdanya for many, many, many years. And uh, for those who want to know more about Navdanya, I have put the link to the courses we offer because I realize that this 36 years of learning from the earth and learning from the farmers and uh, sharing in compassion um, is what is needed today for this de-addiction. So what are the Gates and the Monsantos and the buyers thinking of now? Farming without farmers and food without food. And of course they created clothing without clothing. You know, all that fake material that is now micro particles in the ocean and the fish and pollution everywhere. So we cannot escape. There is no other, and there is no other place where you can dump your pollution. Eventually, it comes back. And therefore, a systems thinking of non-separation and interconnectedness is the beginning of 
how to build sustainability. And once you take that step, you realize the sustainability and justice and dignity and identity are all one continuum. For me, identity is not someone, something someone else gives you, but identity is what grows from your life, from your work, from your sense of place, from your sense of belonging. And that's why we always talk of desh. You know, when we save seeds in Navdanya, we talk about desi seeds of the place. Identity grows from the earth. And my work on Earth's democracy has talked about how the Huntington saw, said, I cannot know who I am unless I know who I hate. And America is overtaken by this, where everyone has a sense of identity based on hate and not knowing who you are, but knowing who you hate. Knowing who you are means you have to know you're part of the earth, you're an earth citizen, you're part of an earth family. Knowing who you are means you have to know the relationships that sustain you. And these are the relationships of gratitude. And knowing who you are has to know you have to know deep within you what is the tana and mana that weaves your soul and your spiritual being. Um, so we are at this moment where we could see extinction fast forward and dehumanization fast forward or a new rising of our humanity, realizing we are one humanity with lots of diversity on one planet with lots of diversity. So it's an exciting moment to be living through and each of us has a contribution to make. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so before I pivot into the questions, I just wanted to note that um, State of Fashion will be having what they call a therapy session coming up. Um, I will have Renee add more details in the chat if folks are enjoying what they're listening to and wanna engage in more conversations in the near future. I am going to look at the questions now. Um, and so the first one, is okay so the first question is for all three panelists and that is what are some specific things that you need now um that can help with your work what is any sort of um any help any connections that can help you each in your work nishant would you like to start uh, i mean it's uh just working together and i don't think we need any help at the moment uh, in any way but if someone would like to be a part of our work and facilitate that it'd be amazing to have more partners uh in this i think that's about it dr shivan rupsi i'll open up to you as well if you have any requests or things to share with the audience well, you know, since I started and I started saving seeds walking on my two feet, we've created 150 community seed banks, including Debel Dave, who actually started uh, with Nathania. We've saved 4,000 varieties of rices, but there's always need to more, for more seed saving so that farmers have more seed sovereignty because all the debt begins with the seed. The dwarf varieties of Punjab to the GMOs of today and with seed you have, you, you, you begin with decolonizing the seed, you can decolonize agriculture. So we want to create more seed banks. We definitely want, you know, we've trained a million farmers or more on ecological regenerative agriculture, organic farming. And we want to make sure that in a decade, all of India is poison free, all of India is suicide free, all of India is malnutrition free. So of course, you know, Navdani is a trust, any contribution, that can be made, but most important is to walk the journey. That's why I put the courses we offer, because we have to walk this journey together, as Nishan said, as partners, as Earth citizens, loving the Earth and sowing seeds of hope. Uh, through Trinjan, we are trying to work on this complete value chain from cotton to yarn to fabric. So there are various aspects that are covered, socio, cultural, ecological, and economic factors. So considering all these factors, if somebody would like to volunteer, somebody would like to help us in working with the artisans, 
may be in infrastructure designing understanding them what skill we already have what resources we already have how do we make good use of good use of it so connecting all those links if we can get some help that would be great beautiful um i think we have one minute so i'm going to add ask the last question which i think is a wonderful one um nishant you briefly touched upon this which is the idea of india not being a homogenous notion of culture um especially when it comes to caste um the question is how can we make sense of the idea of caste when thinking about decolonization in the indian context what we call bias is indeed deeply ingrained in our society which plays into the neo colonial narrative we are being confronted with how can we be aware of this when talking about this issue uh i think like avoiding the caste um uh, i think you just have to stand up against this and a lot of times um a lot of people don't have courage because you know it's 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 difficult to do it with your family systems or difficult to do it within the systems you are bound with. like for example some other some other farmers who we work with you know they don't drink tea from another community of farmers and we just do it we are like if you want to work here this is it this is it like you know you have to drink this tea or you can find another place where you find a better tea there you know like it's so ingrained like can you imagine it's gone so deeply down the uh, down the thing and i always think like a lot of people just don't stand up against this cuz you know they don't want to be against like these systems or it's just like standing your ground standing to your values and no matter what you have ahead like you know you might be you might have to be twice as tall uh to or like maybe more taller you know to 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 fight against this but i think everyone needs to start taking the ground and that's what uh i think that's the only solution there's no like nothing deep i think it's the solution is really simple and everyone just needs to start adopting it they just like sit down like hey i'm going to have the same it's just like having food on the same table with a person and like you know who you normally know you it normally the people won't have that like in india i don't really know how it's uh, over there but in india it's so common not to go like just sit down with people you work with and have lunch on the same table and even doing that like it's not about caste or something but it kind of like subconsciously subconsciously starts feeding it into people's mind that hey like you know we you come from the same place and you go down to the same place you know after shiva yeah quickly first of all you know our freedom movement was an anti caste movement and my parents my mother very active in the freedom movement and they adopted the name shiva to erase caste um as insecurities have grown and polarization has grown this polarization has become very very political but my father used to tell me that one of the reasons you know buddha became the most important teacher and buddhism became the most important religion 2000 years ago and then the brahmins got panicky so it's not that people you know every society has had different vocations but they were horizontally linked and they were chosen by birth i want to be a warrior i want to be a, a wood wood woodsmith i want to be a blacksmith and these were put into an hierarchy and frozen by birth by the brahmanical revival to crush buddhism and jainism that time and that history is only known by the victims as is always the case so a we it's extremely important to know that the artisans of this country are the most important creative pro- workers they are the creative industry and to to bring their identity back through caste outside the stigma by birth and the hierarchy is our work i've known many people who think caste getting rid of caste is get rid of the work the work was never degraded it was the identity it, it it was the the structure that degraded the good work and we very kind of as a beautiful book he says it's only when the workers and the artisans rule and the, because he was addressing the east india company and the, as a trading company says so the rule of trade that they have brought has not just created inequality and aggravated inequality it has actually created divisions you know the hindu muslim problem was totally part of the divided rule of the british empire 
1857 onwards, that's what they did. And that is what we are still suffering. The partition was part of it. The, 18, the 1905 Bengal partition was part of it. The Swadeshi movement began there. But most important is we have to realize that not only defending work, but defending the dignity of work and with it, recognizing that the freedom to choose your work is the true decolonization, decolonizing our past, but also preventing the colonization of our future. Beautiful, thank you, Dr. Shiva. And thank you everyone so much for joining us this morning, this evening, wherever you are. To my three panelists, you are all schools. Thank you so much for your wisdom. Uh, I feel so honored to be in your presence and learning from you. If anyone is interested in learning more, again, there are a plethora of links in the chat and you could find all of our panelists online as well. Thank you everyone so much.